we come to order and welcome to the February 8th Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee. Today we have two bills on our hearing schedule and we will begin with Senate Bill 5423. I'd like to open the hearing on Senate Bill 5423 and staff if we might have a briefing please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ricky Crinzi, staff to the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 5423, which concerns telemedicine consultations. By way of background in Washington, a practitioner who undertakes to diagnose, cure, advise, or prescribe for a person located in Washington must be licensed to practice medicine unless the practitioner falls under a statutory exemption. The statutory exemption allows a practitioner licensed by another state to practice medicine in Washington state as long as the practitioner does not open an office or appoint a place for meeting patients or receiving calls in Washington state. The Washington Medical Commission interprets this exemption as allowing the use of telemedicine technology to facilitate continuity of care to establish patients who cross state borders and to permit peer-to-peer -peer consultations. Under this bill, a licensed out-of-state practitioner may consult through telemedicine with a practitioner licensed in Washington State regarding the diagnosis or treatment of a patient within Washington State. With that, I'll conclude and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ricky, for that briefing. Are there any questions of staff? If so, use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. And seeing none, Senator Rivers is the prime sponsor. Would you like to speak to your bill today? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for rescheduling this bill from Friday. Um, I think Ricky did a phenomenal job presenting the bill. It's pretty straightforward. There are some tweaks that are uh, requested by Department of Health, which Ricky is also working on. Um, but I think this is just a furtherance of our use of telemedicine to fully meet the needs uh, of the individuals that we, we represent here in the state. So thank you so much for hearing the bill and hoping that we can move the bill along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rivers. Are there any questions of the prime sponsor? And seeing none, Mr. Vice Chair, would you like to call forward those to testify? Yes. Um, hold on just one second. I just literally had it up a second ago. Let me give me a second here. You bet. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. That's all right. It's challenging with all the various different screens we have to keep up. We got five of them up. Okay, uh, Stephanie Mason. There's four people, Madam Chair. Stephanie Mason, Claudia Tucker, Jeb Shepard, and Michael Farrell. And while they're coming in, there are four others who have signed in pro, not wishing to testify. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And with that, uh, Stephanie Mason, are you able to unmute? And if so, go right ahead. Welcome. Thank you. You're right. There are a lot of screens to navigate all of a sudden. <laughs> Um, uh, good afternoon, Chair Cleveland and members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Stephanie Mason, and I'm here on behalf of the Washington Medical uh, Commission. So we're the body under the Department of Health that licenses and regulates Washington's roughly 30,000 doctors and 4,000 PAs. Um, we'd like to thank Senator Cleveland for your work on telemedicine as a whole this session, and Senator Rivers for sponsoring um, Senate Bill 5423. The bill will clarify and update Exemption 6 of RCW 1871-30. That's, that's a long number, but as mentioned by committee staff, what it is is a relatively small change. The bill will allow consultation between a Washington state provider and a provider licensed in another state via telemedicine. Um, nearly 30 other states have similar peer-to-peer -peer exemptions, so this legislation will be bringing Washington up to date with current standards nationally. Um, in the past, the Commission has frequently received calls about consultation between Washington physicians and those from other states. So we've used our policy on telemedicine to interpret the, the rather unclear language. However, this bill will put us in alignment uh, with our policy and statute and therefore make the law clean, clear, and specific for us. Additionally, as some of you know, the commission is working on rulemaking regarding telemedicine over the coming year, and this legislation will give us a good start and help us carry forward with corresponding with the statute. 
Um, I thank you for your time. I'm available for any questions you may have. And just so um, the commission or the, sorry, the committee is aware, I'm also joined by my fellow staff men, member, Michael Farrell, and he really is a wealth of historical knowledge and a resource. If you have questions that I can't answer, he's also here to help out. Wonderful. Ms. Mason, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And um, I want to ask if there are any questions at all. And uh, seeing none, um, Claudia Tucker, welcome back to committee. We're glad to have you and go right ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Claudia Tucker, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Teledoc Health. And I'm testing testifying today in support of Senate Bill 5423. We're the global leader in telehealth. We provide care for our clients in all 50 states and 175 countries. Our services include general medical services, mental health treatments, remote patient monitoring, expert medical second opinions, providing robots to the hospital systems, and we place our platforms in hospitals and clinics in both urban and rural areas. Our clients are large and small employers, health plans, healthcare systems, and municipalities. And at Teladoc, nothing is more important to us than clinically based decision making and patient safety. We support this legislation because it will allow Washington state patient to use technology to get a medical second opinion from a specialist outside of the state for a specific disease or medical condition without that, that physician having to be licensed in Washington. Typically, healthcare is regulated at the state where the patient is at the time of the encounter. This change in the statute will allow residents greater flexibility and ownership of their healthcare decisions by removing this regulatory burden. While a specialist may be the best in the country in a specific disease state, he or she may only see one or two Washington residents in a year. And therefore, make this, this making the requirement an expensive licensure and continuing education responses onerous and unnecessary as they are not the treating physician. They are providing their medical expertise to the patient through a Washington state licensed physician. Thank you for your work on behalf of the residents of the state who may be facing some of the toughest decisions of their lives. Trying to find the best medical information and course of treatment do not add to that stress. This bill will increase access to the best state specialists that the country has to offer to all Washingtonians who need that service without having to travel and risk exposure and physical duress. Thank you, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Tucker, for your testimony. I want to ask uh, if there are any questions. And if so, use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Senator Frocht. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Tucker, I know I know she's testified a couple times now for Teladoc. Uh, appreciate your perspective. I, I feel like I actually know. I, I had an acquaintance here who I believe worked for Teladoc here in Washington. If I'm thinking of the right uh, company, I, he was a physician, as I recall. I, I'm, maybe I'm mis, maybe I'm misinterpreting, but I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit about your operations here? in Washington state so we uh, we can understand, because I, I think that your testimony is very helpful in a lot of ways. I think you make some great points about specialty consultations uh, in this realm. It makes a lot of sense. Normally the patient would have to fly out of state to go see, you know, a, an orthopedist for, you know, a knee, you know, you know, athletes do this all the time. They'll be injured in Boston or play for a team in Boston and then fly to New York to have their knee looked at or, or near California. And, you know, I think this bill has the potential to offer that to everyday people, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about your work briefly. Sure, and, and Senator, thank you for the question. I know that everybody's so busy and I love to talk about this. And I really love to, to tell people what our, our footprint is in the state, but usually we're so rushed that I just kind of blow through that and just talk about why the legislation is good. And so we're very, very proud of our presence there in Washington State. Uh, in 2020, we were able to save our patients and pay awards over $34 million. There are 6,200 employers in the state that offer Teladoc as a benefit to their employees. Uh, we've got 2.1 million lives covered in the state. And in 2020, 
we did 71,000 consults and all of our consults are provided by Washington licensed physicians. So we've got over a hundred licensed physicians, Washington licensed physicians. Thank you, Ms. Tucker, and thank you, Senator Fox, for the question. Um, I'm curious too, um, Ms. Tucker, um, are you able to share a little bit more about, you, know, you mentioned specialties, and I can certainly understand that, um, that that may be the expertise that's most often sought um, in these consultations. Can you share a little more about what the most frequent um, needs are in terms of consultation? Is it, is it PEDS? Is Absolutely. It when, we, when we're talking about what this bill would apply to, which is really specialist, and it's when you face that point in your life where you've been diagnosed with a potentially um, fatal disease. And so you go and you want to seek the best help that you possibly can. And so you start looking for the best doctor. And we've got an expert medical service that will align the patient with the best specialist in the country. And so to answer your question, for these specialists, it's usually patients who have received a cancer diagnosis. Uh, cardiovascular is uh, a close second, and then neurological type illnesses for our, spe our expert medical service. Thank you, that's helpful. Are there any additional questions? Senator Holy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, Doctor, I'm curious uh, on, on our side of the mountains, east of the Cascades, I'm from Spokane. Uh, we have an overlapping Venn diagram of one hour travel time, presumably between all the critical care hospitals out there. And a lot of times we're, uh, the, the, the staffing is hard to come by uh, and, and there's, there's alternatives. There's osteopaths and ARNPs and everything else that the staff primary care. You, you're talking about, you made a couple of statements as to within Washington state. Is this something that you can see that would be a great advantage within the state here when you have just marginal providers staffing the, the, these hospitals that are way out in the middle of nowhere to provide some sort of a, uh, an interaction between them that would be an advantage to the patient? Absolutely, that's a great question. And so we do, I'm gonna approach that in two different ways. We lease our platform, so our telemedicine platform to hospitals and healthcare systems, so large physician practices. So rather than reinvent the wheel, they can say, you know what, we wanna make telehealth available to our patients after five o'clock and on the weekends, but we want our doctors to be able to answer those calls. So rather than reinvent the wheel, they can lease the platform from us to use our own doctors. If it's, uh, if it's a holiday season, they can also then use our physicians and everything is transferred back to, to, their, to their clinic. So that's one way to do this. The other way is for rural hospitals, uh, you have a stroke, I live in rural Virginia near Appalachia. So you have a stroke and you could be two hours away from a hospital that can give you that medication that will really limit the long-term lasting effects of a stroke. It's life-changing and I know you all know this, but if you don't live near that hospital, what do you do? So we can, get your, your EMS folks can get you to the local, local regional hospital. They can then connect through, through our doctors, uh, our stroke neurologists, and then they can actually watch that patient, have the doctors there, do the testing, do everything. And then just, as I said, just make life-changing impacts on that patient's future health. So it'll be the difference whether or not they can speak, whether or not they can use the right hand. It's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tucker. And seeing no additional questions, um, we'll move on to Jeb Shepard. Uh, you are next, and please unmute and welcome. Great. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Cleveland and members of the committee. My name is Jeb Shepard, uh, Director of Policy at the Washington State Medical Association, representing physicians across the state, practicing uh, in all specialties and care settings. Uh, thanks to Senator Rivers for bringing this measure forward. We signed in other today, but I did want to testify in support of um, codifying the current practice around out-of-state peer-to-peer uh, uh, consults, you know, telemedicine, as you all know, is advancing very, very quickly. And so this is an area of state statute that should be updated to reflect current practice. Um, we do have one request. And by our read of the bill, it includes only allopathic physicians. 
um, and we'd like that to be expanded to include um, osteopathic physicians and, and other providers as appropriate as well. Um, so if the sponsor is amenable, we'd be happy to work with staff to make that change. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to testify uh, on this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. I want to ask if there are any questions. Senator Rivers. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's the change that Department of Health um, asked to, to make Excellent. in there. They wanted to make sure DOs were included. So good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the recommendation. And with that, we'll move on to Michael Farrell. Welcome, glad to have you here. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Michael Farrell. I'm the Policy Development Manager for the Washington Medical Commission here to support uh, Senate Bill 5423. I support every statement made by my colleague, Stephanie Mason, and I'm here to answer any questions that the committee may have about the commission's work and uh, the application of this much needed licensing exemption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Are there any questions? Any of those who've testified? And seeing none, I believe this concludes testimony then and closes the hearing on Senate Bill 5423. And with that, I'd like to open the hearing on Senate Bill 5399. And staff, if we might have a briefing, please. Certainly, Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, I'm Greg Atanasio, committee staff. Before you is Senate Bill 5399, establishing a universal health care commission. Uh, in 2019, the legislature established the Universal Healthcare Workgroup, which published its report in 2021 that included three um, proposed coverage models. Models A and B are designed to provide coverage to all state residents, including those currently covered by federal programs and undocumented immigrants. Uh, model A would be a completely state administered program, while Model B would be a state governed but health plan administered program. Model C would offer coverage to a segment of state residents focusing on those who do not currently have access to affordable coverage. The report included exam example transition plans to a universal system that included the establishment of a universal healthcare commission to spearhead the work. Uh, the bill before you establishes the Universal Healthcare Commission to develop a plan to be implemented by 2026 that provides comprehensive, equitable, af affordable healthcare coverage under a publicly financed and privately and publicly delivered healthcare system to all state residents. The commission would include legislative members, representatives from the Department of Health, Insurance Commissioner, Healthcare Authority, Health Benefit Exchange, and Office of Equity, as well as eight members appointed by the governor with knowledge and experience regarding healthcare coverage, access, and financing. At least one appointed member must be a tribal government representative with knowledge of the Indian healthcare delivery system. The director of the Department of Retirement Systems would be a non-voting member. The commission may establish advisory committees as necessary. By November 1st, 2024, the commission must submit a report that includes an analysis of Washington's current healthcare delivery system and recommendations for key design elements of a universal system that includes financing, eligibility and enrollment processes, covered benefits, provider participation, provider payment processes, cost containment and quality improvement strategies, initiatives for improving culturally appropriate care, home and community-based services, strategies for strategies to reduce health disparities, IT and financial management systems, data sharing and transparency, and governance structures. The report must also include recommendations for steps Washington should take to prepare for a transition to a unified financing system and recommendations for the creation of a finance committee. The commission must hold its first meeting within 90 days of the effective date of the act and must submit an interim report to the governor and legislature 12 months after its first meeting and every six months thereafter. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Greg, for that briefing. And I want to ask if there are any questions of staff. And I don't see any using the Zoom hand function. Uh, if you raise your hand the old fashioned way, I don't see any questions. So with that, um, Senator Randall is the prime sponsor. Would you like to speak to your bill today? Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Greg, for the detailed briefing and background. You know, for the record, Senator Emily Randall from the 26th Legislative District. I forget that more often than I should. Um, you know, some of you have heard me say this before, but, you know, I knew from the time I was a little girl that Washington State 
could be a strong leader in healthcare expansion. It's because my family benefited personally from the Medicaid expansion of 1993, and it made the difference for us to be able to care and support my sister Olivia, who had severe disabilities, um, allow her to live at home and uh, go to public school. And I know that my family's story is not unique, though we have continued to make incredible strides um, through Washington's early leadership in the 90s, as well as gains made under the Affordable Care Act. We still have, and this is as of November 2020, 541,440 people without coverage in Washington state. That's over half a million people who even with our Apple Health coverage and other subsidies are unable to access the health insurance that they need so that they can go to the doctor without worrying, without putting off, you know, extreme, um, putting off health issues until they become extreme. And we can do better than that. We know we can because we've done it before. We have made great strides, but we have the responsibility now to continue building a path. And as you heard from Greg, there were options um, developed and offered through the work of the Universal Healthcare Work Group, which was a bipartisan and multi-stakeholder effort that worked long and hard over the past many, many months to understand and analyze different options before us. And the reason that we're start that for me that I'm starting with this uh, establishment of the Universal Healthcare Commission is that I think that we have more planning to do. Of the three options that the Universal Healthcare Work Group identified, there wasn't strong consensus around one. Well, you know, Plan A may save us a substantial amount of money and cover more folks um, in a shorter time period it was tougher to figure out how we could get there. And, and so, you know, with, with my own aversion to what could be called incrementalism, I think that we right now need to be taking a planful approach, one that allows us to partner with a federal administration that is now interested in partnering on healthcare expansion, one that um, is better, uh, more likely, I think, to work with us on, on waiver applications, to figure out ways that we can not have to go it alone as a state, not fund an entire health system on our own, but allow us to partner with um, a Biden administration and a Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services that will be a strong partner. And so we'll hear from so many folks, folks who think we should move faster and folks who think we should move slower. And that's the beauty of, um, you know, of the legislative process. We are um, able to get voices from all over that have different perspectives. So I, I really appreciate the time to dig into this next proposed step in the process and allow us to make a plan, a meaningful plan that will cover that half a million folks who are uncovered, who are, won't go to the doctor because they're afraid of the bill, who put off what could be routine care until it becomes, in some cases, fatal. We can do better by our neighbors and I'm offering you this as a step forward. Thank you, Senator Randall, and thank you for your leadership, your hard work on the Universal Healthcare Work Group, and uh, particularly for bringing this uh, next step forward in order to continue that critical work. Uh, Senator Conway has a question. The question is, does your plan incorporate a plan for a heuristic exemption with the federal government? You know, oh, many years ago, many years ago, we were working on universal health care when I first entered the legislature. And uh, one of the key stumbling blocks was the ERISA exemption. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question, Senator Conway, and I'll, I'll invite Greg to correct me if I'm wrong, but this, um, the establishment of the commission doesn't speak directly to the ERISA exemption, but they do anticipate that that would be um, a, a piece that the commission would explore. Thank you. And Senator Kaiser has a question or comment. 
And uh, Senator Kaiser, your audio is not working. Senator Conway's comment reminded me that uh, when I first came to the Senate, uh, the chair of the health care committee was Pat Thibodeau, and she was working on this issue then. And I wonder if it might behoove us to try and get some of those archived uh, records, because it was a really a groundbreaking effort then. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got to keep at it to get it done. But we could learn from what they learned, too. Thank what you. a great idea, Senator Kaiser. Thank you for that. Are there any additional comments or questions of the prime sponsor? And seeing none, um, Mr. Vice Chair, if we can uh, call forward those to testify. And before you do, I want to recognize that we have a large number of individuals who signed in to testify today. And um, to ensure that everyone wishing to testify has that opportunity, I'm gonna ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, as you enter the committee view, you'll see the timer. I will also uh, prompt you when the timer is up. And if you have additional thoughts you wanna share beyond on what you're able to verbally share with the committee today, please submit in writing and we'll be sure that that's distributed to each member of the committee and uh, we have that opportunity for further review. So um, appreciate in advance everyone's respect of each other's time today. And with that, um, Senator Proct, who do we have? Madam Chair, there are, uh, there are 29 people on this panel. I'm gonna start with, uh, in, this, in this list, I'm gonna start with a, a panel that signed in together and then we'll go right back up to the top. So the first group will be Jill Levine, uh, Adam so uh, Autumn Savage, Elena Savage, and Bevan McLeod. And for our staff, they are numbers 23 through 26 on the list. And then we'll start back at number one um, after that. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And with that, uh, Jill Levine, if you're able to unmute, welcome to the committee and please go right ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jill Levine. I live in the 36th Legislative District and I'm here today to testify in support of SB 5399. Uh, I'm a small business owner with a family income at about 90% of the average for my area. I was di diagnosed with ocular myositis in 2013, which is a chronic condition that causes double vision. Um, this has impaired my ability to work. I can do about 25% of the work I used to, and I haven't been able to drive since 2013. Over the last eight years, as, do as doctors struggled first with diagnosis and then with treatment, my insurance pre premiums and out-of-pocket medical costs averaged about 25% of my income. I've explored multiple insurance options available to me and found that the difference between plans never amounts to more than a couple hundred dollars a year. I've also found that I'm priced out of treatment options that could change the trajectory of my illness, could even send it into remission. I've used two different treatment options repeatedly uh, over the years with only a minimal impact, but the next treatment option available costs $12,000 more, which has proved to be out of my family's budget. As it is, we work very hard to just maintain insurance coverage that um, provides very little return. The lower costs of a universal healthcare um, system would substantially lessen our financial burden and increase my options for care and my ability to work. Thanks. Ms. Levine, thank you for your testimony. And um, are, are, you, um, are you open to sharing, um, you have current health insurance coverage, is that I right? do, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, and that just um, doesn't cover your needs, obviously, or meet your needs in terms of treatment. Yes, that is correct. There's just a, it's most of it is paid out of pocket um, mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Are there any additional questions, Miss Levine? And seeing none, we'll move on to Autumn Savage. Autumn, if you're able to hear us, go right ahead and welcome. Uh, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair and the members of the committee. My name is Autumn Savage. I live in the 48th Legislative District, and I'm here today to testify for favor of SB 5399. I'm going to have my mom here, Elena Savage, read because I'm actually having a really bad day. She's got a pretty bad migraine today. So, yeah. Um, so everything I'm going to be saying are her words that she wrote. So it's it's her story. 
Five years ago, I started having a lot of stomach pain and digesting digestive problems. Almost everything I went through in those years, my parents had to pay for out of pocket, and I did not need to get as sick as I am. From the start, doctors didn't listen to me or my parents and made decisions based on what insurance would do. I was told to get therapy, to undergo neurofeedback, to eat better, to stop being stressed. We tried everything they suggested. My mom asked specialists for a colonoscopy and an endoscopy early on. They said no. Without blood in my stool and without any vomiting, which I wasn't doing then, insurance wouldn't allow the tests. My mom said she would pay out of pocket, but they still said no. My health got worse. When I did finally get an endoscopy, the biopsy showed depleted digestive enzymes. This made sense with everything going on with my digestion. The doctor said the results were insignificant. When I finally got a colonoscopy, the results showed elevated mast cells, a sign of mast cell disorder, but the insurance company said insignificant. I was in so much pain all the time. I had to leave school. I had to stop doing all of the things that I really loved doing. One hospital system wouldn't release me until my mom started the inpatient process for an eating disorder clinic. They said, don't worry, insurance will pay for all of it. The same hospital also arranged for several months supply of this gross protein drink they were shoving on me. They said, take it, insurance will pay for all of it, but they wouldn't give me a harmless test for a staph infection. In February of 2020, I was finally diagnosed with Lyme disease. This last October, I was diagnosed with E. e. coli and staph as well. The mast cells in my colonoscopy so many years ago indicated a staph infection. My parents had to pay out of pocket to get all these tests done. My Lyme doctor in Seattle finally got me into a specialty clinic in California because the insurance problems in Washington just reached a point. We are testifying from California right now. Um, Ms. Savage, we're not able to hear you at the moment. Your audio is cut out. Let's take a moment here to. Um, I know, but there's not much I can do about there. it. There, now we can hear you. Go right okay. ahead. Okay. My doctors have also put me on Zyfaxin to help heal my digestive system. Insurance won't pay for it because I'm not 18. It was going to cost my parents $2,000 for a month's supply but my doctors had enough samples to almost cover the 28 day protocol and they gave it to us for free. It's helping, but it's also something doctors could have given me five years ago. I'm supposed to rest and not have stress, except how do I do that? I worry about money. I worry about something happening to my mom or dad. And I worry about everyone else like me who doesn't have parents who can do what mine are doing. I still doubt myself because of everything doctors have said to me. I still wonder if this is all my fault, if I'm crazy. I have Lyme disease and several co-infections, but I didn't need to get this sick. I didn't need to be getting care thousands of miles away from my home without my friends, loss of all Ms. Savage, I think we've uh, had another technical issue. You've frozen up. Would you turn off your camera for a moment and let's see if that'll help there we go. Go right ahead. Look. Are we able to hear you now? Yes, we. Good. Yes. Okay. I think we're there. Yes. Did you thank hear? You. We're finished. If, I don't. Oh, know thank you for that. If, could you repeat just the last um, last sentence so we can, are sure to hear it? Thank you. Yes. Um, do you want to read this last paragraph? Yeah, I think I can. Okay. Um, I have Lyme disease and several co-infections, but I didn't need to get this sick. I didn't need to get care. I shouldn't be needing to get care thousands of miles away from home without my friends. And I've lost most of my body fat and my muscle. And I'm 17 and I'm nowhere getting close to my high school diploma. But thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Autumn, thank you for your time. Thank you for your courage in sharing your story with us today. And I hope that you feel better soon. I suffer from migraines myself and have since I'm a teenage, I was a teenager and I completely understand um, just how debilitating that can be. So I hope you feel better soon. Uh, are there any questions of this uh, young lady or her mom? And I don't see any additional questions. Thank you so much for your time today and your testimony. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to Bevan McLeod. Are you able to hear us, Ms. McLeod? And if so, go right ahead. 
I am. Um, let me just get my, there we go. I think everyone can see me and hear me, hopefully. Yes, we can. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, Alliance for Healthy Washington, which I'm the co-founder and president of, has worked tirelessly with Senate staff and Senator um, Randall to, to bring this bill in front of you. Um, we also worked really hard on getting the Pathway to Universal Healthcare work group passed, and I was honored to serve on that work group for over a year. And um, so I think, you know, in, in, in the interest of really continuing this conversation and pushing the need for universal health care forward and also understanding that the legislature is in a really tight bind right now. We have COVID, we have the need to fund foundational public health, we have education, we have so much that our state needs to fund right now that this was, I think, from my perspective, the biggest piece that we could bring forward to the legislature this session so that we could continue moving this forward. And I just want to say, I know that there are some um, conversations that are going to be coming forward about this being just another study, but the reality is that it's not, that this commission is really put in place to give the legislature exactly what you all need to do in order to make um, our state have a, um, a comprehensive universal health care system to be able to cover all the residents of our state. And in so doing, um, be able to offer revenue solutions, be able to offer you know, technical advice on how to get there. And I will also, I would just like to let the committee know that our organization is also in conversations with members of Congress to talk about how we can get waivers into the state. And so, you know, Representative Pramila Jayapal um, put forward the state-based uh, state based Universal Health Care Act of 2018. And that was taken over by Representative Khanna last year, and he is going to be resubmitting it again this year. So I just want everyone on this committee to know that we are working diligently. We are working very hard, both at the national level and the state level, to make this a reality. And we welcome comprehensive conversations. We welcome collaboration. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone else here today. Um, and I welcome any questions about this process, about why we chose this route. Um, and I'm just so grateful that, uh, for all of the support for everyone who on this committee and throughout the, the legislature in these last few years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLeod. And thank you for all of your uh, advocacy and hard work and your testimony today. I wanna ask if there are any questions. And being none, um, thank you so much for being with us today. Mr. Vice Chair, if we can um, call forward the next to testify. Yes, I'm gonna go in uh, groups of uh, five. Uh, Bunny Hatcher, Michael Benefiel, uh, Katzman Lewin uh, Lewandowski, uh, Kelsey uh, Bresman, and Jennifer Cumbie. And I apologize if I uh, mispronounced anyone's name. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and um, Bunny Hatcher. If you are able to unmute, welcome and go right ahead. I'm Bunny Hatcher and I'm um, here today to offer support for um, $53.99 as gettable. Obviously, I prefer a Medicare for all right now approach and would prefer Senate Bill 50. 204, but I don't, that can't get a hearing. Um, I share um, others' dislike for incrementalism, but I think that's all that that um, we can, oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go okay. right ahead. Um, I think that that's all we can hope for in these times. I support it because it is, um, it, number one, it imposes a deadline. So it's not one of those where we can just keep kicking the can down the road forever and ever and not dealing with it. Um, and that's important to me because we just can't keep waiting. Um, several years ago, I got cancer. And so did one of my best friends, Wanda, and my young son-in-law's best friend, Randy. I had great insurance and I am sitting here today. Randy's cremains are in a Harley Davidson gas can mounted on the wall of his auto shop. And my friend Wanda's cremains are on my hearth guarded by a metal dragon. 
none of this should have happened. They didn't have insurance, so they waited and waited and waited. That's why I'm not into incrementalism. I would like to see this happen tomorrow because I want to know how many Wandas and how many Randys there are going to be between now and 2006. Um, but because this is, I believe, the, the best we can hope for, I'm certainly going to support this um, because it, it it's a means to an end. Um, and that waiting, if, if we just keep kicking the can down the road, the bodies just pile up and pile up and pile up. So I would encourage this body to continue the pursuit of more aggressive Medicare for all type legislation while at least rolling this out and rolling it along so that in, in the interest of getting something done, we can. Thank you, Ms. Hatcher. Thank you for your testimony today. I wanna to ask if there are any questions. Seeing none, we'll move on to Michael Benefiel. If you're able to unmute, go right ahead. Hello, we see you, welcome. Madam Chair, for hearing me, I'm Mike Benefiel, PCO from the 23rd Legislative District and over 50 years a Democrat. In 2019, 82% of Americans favored affordable health care via a single payer system. The Washington legislature had a bill that would provide affordable health care for all in Washington via a single payer system. That bill was ignored by both the Senate and House health care committees. After two years, oh, in favor of a study. After two years of study, the data and the work group members and 100% of the public testimony all agreed with the over 20 previous similar studies that a single payer system was the best for providing affordable health care for all. Here we are once again with a bill in committee, in, uh, in your committee, SB 5204, that would provide the very Model A single payer system favored by the work group study. And it would provide all Washington residents affordable health care and save billions of dollars a year. Once again, this bill is being ignored in favor of another study, this time by a commission. SB 5399 does nothing more than set up a commission with the task of providing recommendations in a report in four years. This bill pushes affordable health care down the road at least four years, and even then, all we will have is a report. No health care bill, no affordable health care. I recommend that this bill, SB 5399, be rejected. SB 5204 be given a hearing. Can we afford to pass up implementing a system that would end needless suffering to Washington residents and save billions of dollars a year? In other words, this bill will cost the state billions of dollars of lost savings every year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benefield. Thank you for your testimony today. I want to ask if there are any questions. And seeing none, we'll move on to Catherine Ledowski. If you're able to unmute. Am I unmuted? Right yes, you are. We can hear you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cleveland, for this opportunity to address your committee. I am Catherine Lewandowski, Chair of Whole Washington, a Democratic PCO from the 39th LD, and a registered nurse here in Washington. Whole Washington represents over 8,000 members, in addition to the legislative district organizations of our preferred political parties. We are healthcare and political professionals and stakeholders in this public policy discussion. We are attempting to present respectfully and courteously to the members of this committee in asking for a full presentation and dialogue on moving the state of Washington forward and providing comprehensive single payer health insurance to all residents as a matter of our universal human rights. As informed stakeholders, we are asking for a full public hearing on 5204 so that we might present to the Senate and to the people of the state of Washington, our informed views regarding public health insurance policies. 
We expect that this issue will become an initiative to the people and have included all the Democratic legislative district organizations in our state in our deliberations. We are also including all interested, interested NGOs in our strategy. Furthermore, we have included our concerns in the Washington State Democratic Platform, where we call for Washington State to establish a universal single-payer health care system for Washington residents, regardless of immigration status, until such time as the single-payer system is enacted nationally. Numerous public policy resolutions have also gone before several of the issues caucuses of the Central Committee. And yet, we understand that this committee has the power to move healthcare quickly in achieving the goals of the working group and in bringing life-saving healthcare to Washington's citizens. We would like to invite and include the members of this committee and their supporters in the ongoing statewide dialogue with other stakeholders as we fundamentally change the way our state provides healthcare to our residents. We thank you for this opportunity to tell you why we are not supporting 5399 because we believe we have a better strategic plan for providing health care to all our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewandowski. Thank you for your testimony. I'll ask if there are any questions. And seeing none, we will move on to Kelsey Bresman. Bresman. Thank you for correcting me, Ms. Bresman. Go right ahead and welcome. Thank you. Hi, Senator and Committee. I'm Kelsey Braceman from District 36. I'm calling in as a private citizen to advocate for universal health care as a matter of urgency. I get my health insurance through Washington Health Plan Finder, where I can choose between a number of private options, frankly, none of which are good. As someone whose employer does not offer health insurance, I pay a few hundred dollars a month as a young and healthy person for the privilege of ensuring that should I need care past $8,000, my insurance will kick in. That's me, I'm young, I'm healthy, and $8,000 is my deductible. Um, this isn't an I feel cared for type of insurance. This is a, if I get hit by a car, I might not go into massive debt insurance. I am paying hundreds of dollars a month to reduce a potential negative rather than for any improvement in my health or my quality of life. In our current system, this is a position of great privilege. It is expensive enough to get necessary care that I am highly incentivized to simply not get care, and I have a history of doing that. Uh, this is broken, and it is much worse for many other people. Um, you are likely already familiar with and empathetic to stories of this type. This is, after all, a hearing for a committee to talk about universal health care. But I am concerned about the lack of urgency implied by this bill. As others have mentioned, there is already a bill, 5204, for universal health care in Washington state. This bill is complete, and it includes funding that will lo lead to lower overall costs per person, even after taxes. Unfortunately, this existing complete bill is stuck in committee, this committee, and has not yet gotten a hearing. I'm here to ask this committee to give Bill 5204 a hearing. I am not opposed to the formation of a committee as called for in SB 5399, but I am opposed to the strategy of let's just keep talking about it when there is a real bill and it is not being given a hearing. So please set a date for that hearing instead of killing it in committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Braceman. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Being none, we'll move on to Jennifer Cumbie. Ms. Cumbie, you are next. If you're able to unmute, I don't see you on the screen at the moment. Ah, go right ahead. It looks as if you're unmuted, Ms. Cumbie. Um, perhaps if you mute and unmute an additional time, we'll be able to hear you. Staff, are you able to um, check that audio for me? Yeah, we'll see if we can do anything on our end. All right. In the meantime, Ms. Cumbie, I'm going to um, I'm going to move on to give us time or give staff time to work with you on your audio. And Mr. Vice Chair, if you could call forward the next to testify. Yeah, the next uh, the next five are uh, Jennifer Cumbie, Jessa Lewis. Chris Curry, and uh, Sarah Weinberg. Okay. And Jennifer Cumbie, I see you, um, and it looks as if you're unmuted. Can you, can you hear us? And it doesn't look as if- uh, Still doesn't appear to be working. 
Her audio is uh, going to be working. So we'll go on to Jessa Lewis. And hello, Ms. Lewis, welcome. Thank you for taking the time today. Go right ahead. Thank you so much, Chair Cleveland and committee for today's hearing. I am here in strong support of Senate Bill 5399 is both a board member of Alliance for Healthy Washington and a mom. I've honestly struggled to pick just one story to share with you today. This morning, I found out the reason why I've been unable to get a heart monitor to help diagnose COVID related cardiac issues is that our, my insurance has twice denied me one without a diagnosed heart condition. It was also, sorry, this is gonna be hard. Just last summer that my daughter, Gray, cold to the touch, collapsed in my arms. She had had a freak ovarian cyst rupture, was bleeding internally, and thought we couldn't afford an ER visit. So had she not found the strength to come out in the living room, she would have died alone in her bedroom. No child should ever make the decision not to tell their parents that they aren't well because they can't afford an ER or because they think we can't afford an ER bill. But they get the message when their insurance isn't accepted at any of the specialists that treat their ailments or the ones that do face month long waiting lists and also when parents put off care because they can't afford it. The challenges in accessing adequate care made it hard at times to, to hold down a job as a single parent. Medical bills and challenges in accessing affordable care have knocked my family out of the middle class. That's why I'm here today. That's why I've gotten involved in politics. This has been a years long passion and I'm with those who are saying we need it now. But I also wanna make sure that we're on a path to actually get it done. Um, families and providers like the ones testifying today are counting on you to fix an inadequate system. 5399 is based on sound languages or sound language and approaches that have worked in the past and embodies the primary recommendations of the legislative work group. It will ultimately save billions a year in untold lives. It is good for the economy, for small and large businesses, for those in urban districts and rural districts. And I don't know, like, it is my hope that we can finally come together around getting this done. I know this has been a decades long effort and I know there's passions on all sides that it's enough, that it's not enough, that people are scared about employee provider plans, you name it, but I really feel confident that this is our way forward. And I'm asking to please pass this bill out of committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Thank you for your testimony and trust that your daughter's doing well now and healthy. Uh, we're, we're getting there. And it, it, when you have chronic conditions, um, it's actually part of why we moved across the state was because I found someone willing to take our insurance over here um, that has been able to help her deal with brain trauma. <laughs> because when you need appointments every week, waiting months between appointments, like the situation was in Seattle, that's insufficient. And someone shouldn't have to move or go out of state in order to get the care that they need. So thank you. Thank you. And Chris Curry. You are next and hello, glad to have you here today and go right ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Curry. I'm a retired RN in Spokane and I've followed the progress of the work group very carefully over the last year. And my conclusion is that universal healthcare in Washington is entirely feasible. With the new leadership in the White House, it is all but certain that we will be able to secure the federal waivers that we need to support state-based single-payer universal health care. And that includes uh, the ERISA uh, waiver and the Medicare uh, payment uh, waivers that Representative Jayapal has so skillfully put forward in her bill. Single-payer has tremendous support across the state and the country, with some 20 states pursuing similar programs. At the same time that insurance companies make healthcare unaffordable, as we've heard today, they add absolutely no value to the system. And we must not allow those responsible for and obscenely profiting from this status quo chaos to determine our collective futures. Universal healthcare has nothing to do with socialism and everything to do with fiscal responsibility and doing right by our people. We cannot afford to wait any longer. Pass 5399, set up the commission, fire the useless insurance companies, 
and get universal health care done once and for all. And please, in much less time than five years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Thank you for your testimony. And with that, we'll move on to Sarah Weinberg. Swineberg, hello, we can see you and please unmute and go right ahead. It's Are you able to unmute, Ms. Weinberg? There, there you we are. Go. Yes. Go ahead. We can hear you. Good. <clears throat> oh, thank you, committee. Um, and I look forward to your passing this bill. As a retired pediatrician and a member of the Universal Healthcare Work Group, and somebody who has been working on getting universal care since the late 1980s, I support Senate Bill 5399. In essence, this bill would start implementation of what a majority of the work group favored, a unified plan for universal health coverage run through a state agency. In other words, Model A. I do have a couple of suggestions though. Number one, there is no mention of a chairperson for the universal health care commission, and there needs to be a good leader, something to consider, inviting an outside expert on health systems to come in as a paid chair slash leader to help guide the group. Just something to think about. And number two, uh, 20, allowing until November of 2024 is too long. The Universal Health Care Commission should be able to do the work by late 2023. That's after all, more than two years from now, so that its recommendations could be processed in the 2024 legislative session. And number three, recommendations for short-term fixes should not have to wait two to three years for the UHCC report. There are people in our state, and we've heard from them, who need help now, especially the undocumented and those unable to afford coverage currently. And I would add to that the large number of people who have uh, technically have insurance, but it's essentially worthless. Um, I would be happy to work with this committee to deal with these concerns slash suggestions if you need any help. Um, I also want to point out the stories we have heard have a common cause. Our healthcare system in the United States is designed as a business caring about costs and profits instead of being designed to provide the care that patients need when and where they need it. That is a paradigm shift that we need to make. Again, I am emphatically supporting this bill and sorry about the telephone. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Weinberg. Do you need to get that? <laughs> no, my no. husband got it, but he just didn't get it on the first ring. <laughs> well, we sure appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. And uh, as we end this panel, I want to just ensure there are no questions from members. If there are any questions, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. And seeing none, uh, we'll move on then. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if you could call forward the next to testify. Yes, uh, I believe it's Dr. Hisham uh, Goeli, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, sir. Uh, Kathy Dupree, Mark uh, Prolix, uh, Mariana Everson, and uh, uh, R. Lefebvre. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Dr. Wooley, welcome. Please unmute and go right ahead. Hi, my name is Dr. Heisen Gwaley. Um, I've been practicing medicine for the last 11 years. I'm boarded in family medicine and boarded in psychiatry, and there is no other job in the world that I would like to have. I love being a doctor. I love taking care of patients. I love being a part of their lives. I love seeing them grow old and helping them have a dignified death. Uh, this past year, I went to help with the COVID pandemic in New York and spent eight months there uh, where I watched an unprecedented amount of people die. 
And what I am hoping uh, is that this committee uh, will move forward of thinking about patients and uh, having their lives be treated with dignity, no matter if they're, uh, uh, what income level they are at. Um, the worst thing that I have heard uh, in the pandemic is I didn't come and get treatment early uh, because I couldn't afford it. And this is something that we have heard before the pandemic, and the pandemic has only made it worse. The inability to pay for health care is often the decision that people are making as opposed to seeking treatment for care. The inability to seek care in a timely fashion leads to more expensive costs in the future. Uh, and overall, not only has physical ramifications, but also mental health ramifications for patients. I am hoping that this committee sees this as an opportunity to move the healthcare system more to humanity and away from profits, to move to a healing system as opposed to a system that fragments care. Regardless of your political affiliation, whether you're Republican or Democrat, regardless of race, creed, or religion, we all just want to live a dignified life and make sure that us and our families have the ability to reach our full potential. And what I'm hoping is that this is a potential first step for all families across Washington to reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grayley. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we'll move on to Kathy Dupre. And Ms. Dupre, welcome. Go right ahead. Okay. Can hear you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Kathy Dupre, and I live in the 23rd Legislative District. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss why I'm not supporting 5399 today. We are currently in a pandemic, and we have hundreds of thousands of people including migrant farm workers and people of color who lack health care. It is important to provide health care to everyone around us in our communities. By postponing the implementation of a university, universal health care system, we're not providing necessary health care to our communities. We cannot afford to wait another four to six years to provide universal health care for neighbors in our communities. Expediency is of the utmost importance as we work to mitigate the negative impacts of this virus on the hardworking residents of our state. We must run quickly and clear all of those hurdles with sincere determination to put a workable plan in place for our communities. For these reasons, I respectfully request that this committee have a hearing on Senate Bill 5204. We have solutions to share with you and request the immediate opportunity to have a frank dialogue with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frey. Thank you for your testimony. And Mark Prolex, are you able to unmute? I am. Yes. Wonderful, we can hear you. Welcome, go right ahead. There we go, I'm able to do video too. Many talents. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Mark Crew, and I'm a Democratic PCO in the 33rd District. Uh, prior to retirement, I was a member of SPIA, the Boeing Engineers Technical Workers Union, for 28 years, and am the son of a 50-year member of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America. As a result, I know firsthand how important health insurance is to quality of life. Everyone, not just those lucky enough to have it, deserves health care. I oppose Senate Bill 5399. People in this state are suffering and dying for lack of health care. The last thing they need or want to hear about is another study to determine a path toward universal health care. The Universal Health Care Work Group conducted a comprehensive study of the problem. They determined that Model A, a not-for-profit single-payer system, would cover nearly everyone in the state and save billions of dollars in the process. They noted its clear superiority to a publicly financed, privately administered program. These studies have all been completed, and now is the time for action. The Health and Long-Term Care Committee has in its possession a bill SB 5204 that would solve the problem now 
This bill has been fine-tuned by many experts and has been vetted by the Departments of Revenue and Employment Security to ensure that it will mesh with their systems. It contains a legitimate transition plan. The committee should give this bill the hearing that it deserves. Thank you for allowing me to testify today and I welcome the opportunity to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Prune. Thank you for coming before us today. And uh, with that, I'll call on Marianna Everson. Are you able to unmute? Marianna, where are you? And it, I don't it, believe that she's in the room. Okay. All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, we'll move on to Arla Fave, and we'll come back to Ms. Everson if she joins us later. Good afternoon, Chair Cleveland. I'm Rick Lefebvre, and I live in the 20th, 20th Legislative District. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss why I'm not supporting Senate Bill 5399. Whereas Senate Bill 5399 requires the commission to spend another two years to study and submit a report that essentially duplicates the effort of the last two years of dedicated work by completed by Universal Healthcare Working Group, Senate Bill 5204. That actually gives the board of the whole Washington Healthcare Trust and its working committees the direction and the ability to establish a benefits package and a funding mechanism, necessary premiums, develop guidelines and quality standards, and many other necessary rules to establish the trust fund quickly and with due diligence. The work of this is proposed commission in SB 5399 has already been done. We have listened to all too often to public testimony of medical debt and bankruptcy due to underinsured and the uninsured. We do not, we don't need to wait until 2026 to achieve comprehensive universal health care for everyone in Washington state. We not, must not wait another five years to give our citizens the dignity and security they deserve to be able to obtain the health care they need from any provider in Washington state without risking their financial security and emotional well-being. I respectfully encourage and request this committee have a hearing on Senate Bill 5204. It's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lefebvre. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here with us today. And uh, Ms. Uh, Mariana Everson, I see that you have joined us now. Please go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Mariana Everson. I'm a registered nurse serving the people who need us the most in a mental health evaluation and treatment facility. I live in the 19th Legislative District. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss why I am not supporting 5399. Senate Bill 5399 establishes a Universal Health Care Commission whose task it is to develop a plan to be implemented by 2026 and provides comprehensive equitable, affordable health care coverage under a publicly financed and privately and publicly delivered health care system to all residents. Thankfully, this work has already been completed with the comp comprehensive language of 5204. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the redundancies that have been included in 5399. For example, by May 15th of 2022, uh, SB uh, 5204 would establish not only an administrative board of trustees, but also three committees that would immediately oversee the administration of the whole Washington Health Trust, a finance committee, a citizens committee, and a providers committee. 5204 creates a financial committee that made up of financial experts in developing a sound, financing uh, policies for the trust. It creates a citizens committee to address quality, priorities, benefits, access, and other important concerns for our residents. It creates a providers committee to address pro provider needs regarding quality, continuity, resource utilization, and other provider issues. And SB 5204 by March of 2022 could establish and define a well-rounded bipartisan administrative board and committees that will be able to address the needs of all stakeholder, stakeholders and then quickly establish a healthcare program of such importance and urgency with utmost speed and confidence. For these reasons, we respectfully request that this committee hold a hearing 
on SB 5204 in order to have a more in-depth discussion of these two bills. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Everson. Thank you for your testimony and for uh, being with us. I want to pause for a moment at the conclusion of uh, this panel of presenters and ask if there are any questions. And seeing none, we'll move forward then. Mr. Vice Chair, if you could call forward the next to testify. The next uh, few are Jason Call, Marlene Albright, Marcia Stedman, Andre Stackhouse, and Carl Baker. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Jason Call, if you are able to unmute, there you are, go right ahead, welcome. Just a second, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Jason Call. Uh, I live in the 44th Legislative District. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss why I'm not supporting 5399. Whereas 5399 creates a commission to look at implementing the recommendations of the Universal Healthcare Working Group, 5204 is a comprehensive bill that has been vetted by our own Department of Revenue with funding language included to allow them to be able to collect the necessary payroll taxes and premiums that would then replace what our residents and businesses are currently paying for their for, for profit first health insurance plans. In part two of 5204, that's section 2021A, businesses would have until 2026 to be required to pay the healthcare assessment of 10.5% of their employees payroll, of which up to 2% could be passed on to their employees. Although they could choose to opt in earlier than that when the trust becomes active by November of 2022 per section 1071C. Alternately, for a small business with less than 50 employees, they would have the option to request a waiver from the health care assessments due, if needed, through May 15th, 2028 per section 2026. Senate Bill 5399 offers only unnecessary delay and no direction to achieving the goals of the Universal Healthcare Working Group, which is to provide comprehensive, equitable, and affordable healthcare coverage under a publicly financed and privately and publicly delivered healthcare system to all state residents. For these reasons, I respectfully request that this committee have a hearing on Senate Bill 5204. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Call. Thank you for your testimony. And we will now call Marlene Albright. Ms. Albright, are you able to unmute? And I don't see you on the screen quite yet. Ms. Albright, we'll come back to you as I don't see you. Ah, there you are. I see you now. Go right ahead and unmute. Okay. There can we go. We can hear you. Yes, we can. Right. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, some of you have heard of the Seattle process. This is what Senate Bill 5399 reminds me of. It's obviously a bill not to implement single payer, but to delay it and eventually kill it. I would like to know what happened to the legislators who wrote this and signed on to it. Where is your moral compass? Some of you have received unconscionable amounts of money from corporate help. Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not believe in incrementalism. He created the plan for Social Security on June 29th, 1934 and it was signed into law on August 14, 1935, a little over a year. The bill proposed by Senator Hasegawa, Senate Bill 5204, has been vetted and is ready to go. Senate Bill 5399 sets up a commission drawing out the process to 2025. We do not have time to wait. People are hurting, especially during this pandemic. They are afraid to see a doctor because of the cost. It is cruel and intolerable that SB 5399 is allowed a hearing, but a far superior bill, Senate Bill 5204, is not. And I would like to finish by saying, 
Martin Luther King talked about the fierce urgency of now. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Ms. Albright. Thank you for your testimony. And we'll move now to Marcia Stedman. Ms. Stedman, welcome back to the committee. And if you're able to unmute, please feel free to begin. Yes, thank you. I am able to unmute and now I think you can see me <laughs> and I can see you. Um, first of all, thank you, Senator uh, Cleveland, Madam Chair, for this opportunity and members of the committee. And I'm Marcia Stedman with Healthcare for All Washington. And I wanna thank Senator Randall as well for, for sponsoring this important bill, which um, we do wholeheartedly support here at Washington, Healthcare for All Washington. The commission, of course, would carry forward the recommendations of the Universal Healthcare Work Group. Um, others have pointed out the superiority of a publicly funded and um, administered plan. So I won't go into that now, but I will say that for decades, we have seen a host of problems caused by unaffordable and inaccessible health care. Now, as the pandemic drags on and disproportionately affects Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, we see the economic inequality in our country grow ever larger, and the effects of systemic racism become painfully clear. We have heard um, mentioning testimony today and many other times uh, at hearings from patients that are disproportionately affected by the inadequate health care that they have here in our country because it's profit driven. Um, now is the time to do right. Another quote by Martin Luther King. The time is always right to do right, but we need to do it right. And this, this problem has been existing for decades and we know it. With a, the healthcare system in our country, the economy contributes 18% to our gross, democratic, gross um, domestic product. This ship is really hard to turn quickly. And rather than jumping into something that is um, not completely understood and doesn't mesh completely well with our state system, and, this, and the federal systems are not in place to actually um, help what, what we could do here, provide the funding, provide the support. It's, it's not a good idea to go ahead so quickly. So we think the time is right to bring just health justice here to Washington through this um, commission. And we urge you to pass it forward and to improve it by making it a timeline a little bit shorter. That would be great to have a few years lopped off of the timeline. And um, just uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to working with you as the bill progresses. Thank you. I do as well. And thank you very much for your testimony today, Ms. Stedman. With that, we'll move on to Andre Stackhouse. Mr. Stackhouse, hello. Go right ahead. Oh. Welcome. Hello, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Andre Stackhouse and I'm a voter in the 36th Legislative District. Our private employer-based healthcare system leaves both hardworking people and businesses paying excessive costs for low coverage private health insurance. It's a bad deal for our business community and its employees. Putting the cost burden of healthcare coverage on our workforce, uh, for our workforce as a payroll expense, forces businesses of all sizes to allocate time, money, and personnel to interact with a complicated and fractured system. Those resources could be otherwise invested into wages, products, and services. Meanwhile, many working people feel trapped at their jobs and are terrified to pursue their education or to start their own business because doing so would likely mean losing what health insurance coverage they have. It's a risk that for many means a serious risk to their life and their financial future. And so Washington loses the opportunity to share in their ambition ingenuity and prosperity. While 5399 offers missed opportunities for our citizens to recover from this economic crisis, 5204 will allow them to spread their entrepreneurial wings. Giving comprehensive nonprofit public health insurance to everyone in Washington is not just the right thing to do, it's good economics and it's a sound investment in ourselves, which is why over 80% of the people in our state want single payer. Our priority is to see this legislation pass, whether through the initiative process or the legislature, but the fastest path is through this committee. The people of Washington State say that it's time to negotiate a better deal 
by giving Senate Bill 5204 a hearing. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Stackhouse. Thank you for your testimony and for being with us. And we'll move on to Carl Baker. Mr. Baker, if you're able to unmute. And I don't see you on the screen at the moment. Take a, a moment here while we have this pause and um, go back to Jennifer uh, Cumbers. Jennifer Cumber, whom we called earlier and weren't able to hear. And Ms. Cumber, are you able to unmute? Yes. And can you hear us? Wonderful. We can hear you. Go right ahead. Can I thank you for thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time and going back and letting me share my testimony today. Um, so thank you, Chair Cleveland and committee. I'm here in strong support of SB 5399 because I don't want other parents to go through what we suffered. On March 2nd, 2007, I was eight months pregnant with my second daughter at the Sacred Heart Emergency Department when a physician told me that my two-year-old daughter had cancer. We were admitted the, that very night for a one month stay to treat my daughter's leukemia, but that initiated a two and a half year chemotherapy regimen in an attempt to save her life. Upon her stabilization, we returned home only three days before I was in labor and I had an emergency C-section and my youngest, my new infant, was admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. My husband's employer provided us with a good insurance policy from a major provider and we had six months of expenses that we had saved up, tucked away in savings. We felt prepared financially and we reserved our worry for the lives of our two children. Several weeks later, the, board, the bill started pouring in and shockingly, many of the charges went straight to out of pocket expenses due to several specialists not being contracted with our insurance. Although treatment was provided in an in-network hospital, the hospitalizations for myself, my two children, resulted in a medical debt of over $30,000 in one month, with us facing more than two additional years of chemo and hospitalizations to save my daughter's life. Our community held garage sales, auctions, and various online fundraisers to help us through, only to have my second daughter diagnosed with the same cancer two years later. And so we began the entire process again. We are fortunate that my children survived, but we continue to battle with this inhumane system as we struggle to cope with the physical, emotional, and psychological latent side effects of the treatments used to save their lives. We had to choose less ideal options that we could afford instead of what was recommended by their team of professionals. Please pass this bill out of the committee because even though we had two insurance policies and six months worth of expenses set aside, it just wasn't enough for my family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your personal story, Ms. Cumbie. Thank you for your patience in waiting today for us to get the audio working correctly for you. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll go back to Carl Baker. Mr. Baker, welcome and go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Carl Baker. Uh, I live in the 8th Legislative District, uh, and I'm the president of the Tri-City Democrats, our local potluck group. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss why I'm not supporting uh, SB 5399. Um, our state has just spent $500,000 and two years studying how to best implement a universal health insurance system in Washington. Uh, and we just don't have time to keep looking at what we knew, know we need to do. Multiple studies have shown that we can save the most money by moving to a single payer system at both the state level and nationally and improve outcomes. Uh, although the working group could not come to consensus, they did offer three options for moving to the universal health care in Washington. Uh, option A was overwhelmingly the most powerful, uh, popular, and is estimated to save over $2 billion the first year and over $5 billion in successive years uh, by establishing a publicly financed insurance plan that covers everyone with comprehensive health care. Uh, SB 5204 is such an option and can be, can be implemented now in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee for allowing me to say a few words about health insurance in the state of Washington. Uh, we've worked many years and consulted with experts in every aspect of SB 5204, uh, and we want to share it with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker, for your testimony. And uh, Mr. 
Oh, first I want to take a moment and ask if there are any questions of this panel of those who've testified and seeing none. Um, hey, Mr. Senator, Vice Chair. Uh, Senator Vandeweghe has a question. Oh, thank you. Uh, Senator Vandeweghe. Ah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I was actually just wondering, not necessarily for the panel, but did we get a link to the report or can staff send out a link to the report? I know when we did a work session on it in the fall, it was just uh, getting completed. Yes, absolutely. We can send that out. I think it came um, the first week of session, the first week session started. But absolutely, if we can um, have that sent out to members, um, Thank you. Staff, that would be helpful. Thank you. And if there aren't any additional questions, um, Mr. Vice Chair, if you'll call forward the next to testify. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, De uh, Deirdre G, Lynette Vares, Laura Fielding, Pete Lamb, and then I'll just go ahead and call forward the last three as well. Uh, Dr. Bruce Davidson, Chris Vandley, and Linda Seltzer. Great. Thank you. Um, so Deidre Gee, are you able to unmute mute? And if so, go right ahead. I can see that you're unmuted. Are you able to hear us? I see you, and uh, why don't you unmute or mute and unmute again? Are you able to hear us? Yes, okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can now, okay. welcome. Okay, sorry about that. All right. All right. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair, um, for having me today. Um, my name is Deirdre McTeergy. Um, I am a voter in the 49th Legislative District. Um, and I thank you for this opportunity today to discuss why I do not support Senate Bill 5399, but instead I'm asking you and the rest of the committee to let Senate Bill 5204 have a full hearing. 5204 is a fully fleshed out bill complete with funding and a rollout plan as we have already heard. We've been talking about universal health care for years in this country, going nowhere fast with countless investigations and studies done to prove or disprove its efficacy. Meanwhile, people keep dying from easily preventable illnesses and injuries due to the exorbitant costs of health care. It should come as no surprise that minorities are disproportionately affected. While the economic disparities between minorities and white people have already have always existed, COVID has really blown the door open. I grew up in northeastern Washington. I lived there for six years, and my mother was a great friend of the Spokane tribe. And while I have since moved away from the area, I have kept in contact with several of my indigenous friends, some of whom now live in Oregon, and they have all been severely impacted. Um, one of the hardest hit groups in our state has been the indigenous tribes. Um, in July of 2020, COVID was tearing through Yakima Nation, just a little bit northeast of me, with an estimated 6% of tribal members testing positive for the novel virus. Today, Yakima Nation is still grappling with the impact of COVID. To date, 43 members have died, including several prominent figures in leadership and education of the next generation. These are people that were building the community that has been destroyed for hundreds of years in this country, and they died simply because they did not have access to adequate health care. We cannot wait anymore. We can't say, okay, five years from now, let's look at universal health care. We need it today. Also, this goes beyond healthy workers are more productive. The very first selling point of your bill, when I read it earlier today, an entire culture is being decimated due to lack of health care. We need a universal bill that puts people first and views them as people, not workers. Senate Bill 5204 would do exactly that. It's a bill for the people, by the people. Until we have a universal health care bill that acknowledges that health care is a human right, minority groups like our indigenous tribes will continue to get left behind and suffer from lack of adequate health care. For these reasons, I respectfully request that this committee have a hearing on Senate Bill 5204. 
Additionally, I ask that everybody who supports 5399 but has requested a faster timeline seriously look into Senate Bill 5204 and request that this committee give it the hearing that it deserves. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for coming before us. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it very much. And with that, we'll move to Lynette Veers. Welcome. Go right ahead. Hello. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Cleveland and the committee. My name is Lynette Veers, and I am the president of Washington State Nursing Association. And hello, Jeff Holy. He's my senator. I'm here from Spokane. Hello there. It has been my pr privilege and pleasure to have been part of the Universal Healthcare Work Group. A lot of work was done, and this is our plan to move forward exactly with a commission. Now, for the last four decades, the Washington State Nursing Association membership has endorsed universal health care. So I'm not speaking alone here. The commission will, cre uh, the commission will create bills that we can get forward. I really appreciate Senator Randall when you said incrementally it's tough, but I'm afraid <clears throat> that's probably exactly what we're gonna have to do. But each year we'll be passing bills to get us there. Now, speaking as a nurse for nurses, this COVID-19 has just knocked us and it has really unloaded a real sad situation of disparities and people of color, gender, it has uncovered racism that I'll have to say I was not aware of. And we are working as a, as a nursing association to clear that up and be on top of that. So I, I am supportive of this and I really appreciate the passion that people have been uh, explaining for and against. Uh, that is what will move us forward. And just welcome you to imagine what would it be like to live in Washington State and everybody has access to health care, affordable health care? Uh, imagine what it would be like to go into a procedure and already know how much that procedure is going to cost and not go into bankruptcy or have to go online and develop a GoFundMe account just because you have medical bills. That would be incredible. You know, the other thing is United States Marines, I like their motto leave no one behind. Why can't we do that? And I think we can. I, I urge you to pass out of your committee, Senate Bill 5399. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beers. Thank you for your testimony today. Appreciate that. And Laura Fielding, you are next. If you're able to unmute, hello. Go right ahead, welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Laura Fielding and I am a voter in the 27th Legislative District. I'm here, thank you for the opportunity to discuss why I am not supporting 5399. I speak today as a veteran for peace who had the privileged opportunity of living for many years and studying in uh, the UK where healthcare is guaranteed as a human right. Over 15 years ago, I was asked by some of my student colleagues who worked within the NHS how I could stand, how I could bear it to serve a country that leaves so many behind. I am uh, fortunate now because my husband retired at 21 years to have TRICARE for life. I will never have to worry about whether I can take my son to see a doctor. I was able to seek the care that I needed for a lifelong uh, addiction. I sought recovery um, about eight years, uh, eight years, I wish eight years, eight months ago. And the majority of that was covered thanks to my VA benefits, the TRICARE. That is a very personal story that I didn't intend to share today, but I see now that the pressing need is just so, too great to leave these personal details out. Um, about three and a half years ago, I came up with the idea, thanks to the Women's March and the many crafters who had knit the pink hats and marched, and the aerial views inspired me uh, to think, what would happen if we had that kind of crafting solidarity for national improved Medicare for all? I was listening to uh, a nurses rally of National Nurses United, 
um, where Roseanne DeMora was speaking and Dr. Jane Sanders. And I thought to myself, well, it needs to be a beret as I am a veteran, a United States Air Force veteran. So I began knitting these. I wasn't connected up to any activist community at that point. I was just really well aware that it was time to do something. So then I reached out or I put these pictures up on social media and it was a nurse named Catherine Lewandowski who saw my posts. She messaged me and said, I think this is a beautiful idea and I would like to drive down and talk with you about this. She drove all the way down to Tacoma from Everett just to hear about an idea about crafting some hats. And then she said, do you know who whole Washington is? And I said, I really don't know who anyone is, um, but I'd love to hear about it. And she said, well, I urge you to reach out to them and to get involved and bring this creativity to whole Washington. I am urging and asking this committee to please give SB 5204 a full public hearing. We are in the middle of a pandemic. The people deserve it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fielding. Thank you for sharing your testimony and uh, and your red hat looks wonderful on you. I have a pink hat. I will hope to have a red hat one day too. So with that, um, I'd like to move to Pete Lamb. Mr. Lamb, you are next. And if you're able to unmute. I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome, go right ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Pete Lamb and I am a lifelong resident of the state of Washington. I'm a proud 22 year member of the Teamsters and I am born and raised in Lakewood. As the son of a single mother, I also know what it means when your mom has to take you to the factory with her because if she didn't, she would lose her job and we would lose our health care. And too many under this harsh reality live under this harsh reality today and that has to change. As a labor negotiator that has negotiated labor agreements affecting thousands of members, I can tell you that oftentimes health care is the last item on the table during negotiations. And it's usually our biggest fight. And, you know, I believe that doing something big with our health care system in the end can be a win win situation for everybody, labor and employer. And so I think it's so important here. I also think it's important as a labor negotiator to point out that, you know, when you look at this bill, intent is crucial. It's not always about the words, it's about the intent. And the intent of this commission is not just uh, to play games with timelines, it's to put something fully vetted that will help the residents of the state of Washington. For too long, I think we've spoken past one another, so often not. And for too long, I think we've had those that wanna tell us that they know better, that they are the experts, that they are the all-knowing, and if you don't get on the bus with them, well, you're against healthcare for all. And I don't think that that type of dialogue for the last few years has been productive. In fact, I believe it's divided us. Divide us on an issue that we all should be on the same page and path forward. But we can change and it needs to change. We need to work objectively to make sure that healthcare becomes a human right in the state of Washington. And I believe very strongly that SP 5399 is the start of that. And let me just say this one more, one more time. SP 5399 isn't simply just another study as some have tried to suggest. It's actually about doing the work and getting it done right by building the foundation and structure to make sure that healthcare being a human right is just not a few spoken words, but rather a reality for all in the state of Washington. I think we can get there. I think labor, I think having stakeholders at the table is so crucial. And I, you know, I hope that we can work together. I hope that whole Washington and all of us can get together in the same room, hash this out and walk out with a plan that will finally, finally cover the citizens of the state of Washington with the health care we all deserve and have Washington state be the uh, beacon and the light to show that health care in our state isn't just talk. It is a human right and we've got it. 
thank you. I thank support. You I urge you to support 5399. Thank you thank so you much for your that. testimony, Mr. Lamb. Appreciate you coming before us. And we'll move on to Dr. Bruce Davidson. And doctor, are you able to unmute? And if so, there you are. Go right ahead. Hello. Thank you, Chairman Cleveland. Thanks to all of you for this opportunity to speak. I live in the 34th. I've practiced pulmonary and critical care medicine in rural locations all over Washington and in Seattle. I favor single payer health care to optimize patient care. And I began to favor it since I read an article in 1991 in a medical journal. Dallas County, Texas had two and a half million people. The CEO of their hospital of 690 beds and all their clinics laid out the rationale and the operational foundation. This is nothing new. I was initially quite enthused about the work group bill as, and followed each session as, Dr. Rand, as Senator Randall spoke about. But as I saw it, I found it akin to a Soviet style legislative fake that I learned about in elementary school in the 50s and 60s. For example, Washington law and the work group's own charter require prompt posting of minutes and summaries after meetings. But the state reps and the state senators on that work group just stopped posting minutes altogether. That's, that's right, Senator Randall, until draft summaries appeared this week. Health Secretary Wiesman and Director Sue Birch selected the work group members, pitting the lions of for-profit care against the retired genteel lambs favoring single payer. Wiesman is gone, replaced by Health Secretary Shaw, who chooses to remain living in Houston, commuting despite our pandemic. Dr. Shaw and Ms. Birch would pick the puppets on the new commission, persons poisonous to universal care, in a bill intended to delay it. We've heard uh, a couple quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King. I'll give you one more from his letter from a Birmingham jail. Wait means never. I hope you'll block this bill and pay attention to 5204. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. And we'll move on to Chris Bandley. You are next and welcome. Go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon. For the record, Chris Bandley here on behalf of the Association of Washington Healthcare Plans. Um, so obviously the health plan community would have some significant concerns with a with a commission with an explicitly stated legislative mandate to one day supplant uh, our industry here in the state. However, we're actually not signed in opposed to this legislation. We're signed in other because we acknowledge there are flaws in the existing healthcare financing and delivery system. You've heard a good number of them pointed out in testimony today, and we don't minimize that those flaws exist and that more work needs to be done. We actually think a commission such as contemplated by this legislation might actually be a good thing if its, um, if its focus was broader than simply trying to come up with the plan for single payer health care. Um, we think it's missing an opportunity to solve problems in the in the short and medium term by if you're going to bring if you're going to bring a group like this together and bring the experts together. I think there are a lot of pressing issues that in the nearer term could solve a lot of problems, regardless of how the healthcare system is financed now or in the future. Just to just to list a few of the things that we think the the work group or the commission should be given given as in, given as targets to study. I mean, affordability is obviously big for our industry. Uh, we, with something that we struggle with trying to provide to consumers. Um, gaps in coverage, we know that there are populations out there right now that, that aren't covered or aren't covered uh, in a very affordable way. We think continuing to look at whether we could have an individual mandate in the state of Washington is, is, is worthy to continue. Pharmaceutical pricing, provider consolidation and pricing, value-based purchasing, you know, there's a, there's a whole list of things that, that are out there that, uh, that if this group is put into law that we think that they should be given, given a charge to look at as, as well. We think that the total cost of care commission that was just passed by legislation last year, the uh, all payer claims database and other sources are out there to help inform, inform this work to make, make progress on improving the system, system that we have for now. And, you know, if, if the, and end goal is still what it is, then at least it'll be a better a better system that they're building upon. So uh, with that, we thank you for your time and look forward to working with you as this legislation moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bandley. Thank you for your testimony. And with that, we'll move on to Linda Seltzer. Ms. Seltzer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Go right ahead. 
Uh, my name is Linda Seltzer. I live in Redmond, Washington. I'm speaking as an individual and not on behalf of the group. And my comment, I've signed in as other, and my comment is about process. Input from stakeholders throughout the state is necessary to make a new system work. As just one example, actuarial reports are one method of financial assessment, but how actual low-income senior citizens access health care is another. Waivers to move senior citizens from federal Medicare to a state system could be detrimental to subscribers and to the national Medicare system as a large pool of subscribers. Those affected by such plans need to have a voice. What percentage of senior citizens in Washington state currently have Medicare Advantage and what percent have, governor, um, have government Medicare? How do people make these plans work? What is the reason for their choices? And this should not be asked as a multiple choice questionnaire, but, but as detailed comments. Is it better for a state to subsidize premiums for government Medicare Part D and supplement plans um, rather than um, move senior citizens to a state plan? How does any of this affect Medicaid, Medicaid spend down? How does a state without an income tax assume a program that is now funded by the federal government that has an income tax and Medicare tax? There are too many unanswered questions. A commission needs to seek and value large-scale public input and not bypass it. Thank you for taking my comment. Ms. Seltzer, thank you for your testimony and those um, most important questions that you've raised. Thank you for the time today. I'm going to just ask before the, we conclude this panel whether there are any questions. And seeing none, uh, I believe this concludes testimony. Mr. Vice Chair, are there others signed in not wishing to testify? Yes, uh, I was going to point that out, Madam Chair. There are uh, 171 other people that signed in on this bill not wishing to testify. I'm, I'm estimating, I didn't, I tried to count. It was a little, I got, got my count was off a little bit, but I believe there were about 20 that were con or other uh, and and, a, and a, a, about 150 or, or, or the 150 of the rest that were pro, signed in pro, mm -hmm. that's an estimate. I don't know that to be exact, but it's in the record if anybody wants to look at it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And with that, this concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 5399 and closes the hearing on Senate Bill 5399. And I move that the committee be adjourned. Oh.